Okay, the poem begins with a line, I don't know politics, but I know the names of those in power, uh, which kind of uh, reflects the poet's uh, unwillingness to know about those people in power. And she says that she knows the names of the politicians, but she does not know much about politics. And this might seem that uh, she is a bit uh, irresponsible. She is not totally aware of the political scenario that uh, that is extant uh, during her time when she is writing this poem. But she says that she can repeat the names of the politicians like days of week or months and she in fact names one politician, one major politician who was our Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru. So she says that she does not know much about politics, but she can repeat the names of the politicians and in a in a sort of a mechanical way. She has the names memorized, as it were. And then you have after the period uh, that comes after Nehru. She says, I am Indian, very brown, born in Malabar. And here we have uh, three different aspects of her identity. The first one is, of course, national identity. The second one is her racial identity. And the third one is kind of local identity. So she is, to begin with, an Indian. And the color of her skin is brown, like most Indians. And she is born in Malabar. And then she talks about languages. She says that she speaks three languages and she clarifies further that she writes in, she is able to write in two languages and she dreams in one. Now, this is a bit curious uh, because we know that dreams do not necessarily have a structured language. Language is used for communication and dreams are not necessarily thought of as uh, modes of communication. So this is a bit curious. So here we have a kind of a figurative use of language because the word dream here does not mean the dream that we see while sleeping. But dream here refers to aspirations and goals that we have, that we harbor in our lives. So uh, here uh, Kamala Das suggests that uh, dreaming also requires a mode of communication or a medium, so to speak, and which is which which is structured like a language, perhaps. So she says that I dream in one language and I write in I am able to write in two languages. OK, so she knows she she can speak three languages in total. So this is also a part of her identity. Her linguistic abilities go on to shape her identity, an aspect of her identity. And then you have another perspective. When she says that I am an Indian, I am Indian, very brown, born in Malabar, I speak three languages, she is using the personal pronoun I. She is talking for herself, she is talking about herself, she is talking about her identity and her abilities. And then you have another voice telling her, don't write in English, okay? Don't write in English. Why? And who are these people that are preventing her or asking her not to write in English? English is not your mother tongue. Now, this is a very interesting discussion. This is a very interesting point. What should be the language of one's choice. What language should one write in while writing or composing literature? Should a person always write in their mother tongue? <clears throat> the, the answer is obviously no, because we know a lo about a lot of authors, a lot of great novelists and poets who have written in other languages, in languages other than their mother tongue. And they have been quite successful. I can give you one example. Vikram Seth, uh, you must have read his writing. He is a fantastic writer and he is a master of the English prose style. So it's not necessary for a writer to always write in his or her mother tongue. <clears throat> mother tongue is important, but in a different sense. Uh, but in this poem, I think Kamala Das refers to mother tongue as the language in which she dreams. 
but that does not stop her from using other languages for example the language english to write literature so uh, what people have said to uh, kamala das is don't write in english english is not your mother tongue and then she responds to those critics she responds to those people by saying why not leave me alone critics friends visiting cousins and these are actually the people who have asked her not to write in english critics friends visiting cousins you have a uh, you have an eclectic assortment of people telling her to not write in english so she is asking them to leave her alone why not leave me alone critics friends visiting cousins every one of you why not let me speak in any language i like she says that a person a writer should have the freedom to choose his or her language why not let me speak in any language i like the language i speak becomes mine this is a very important statement this is a very thought provoking statement as it stands the language i speak becomes mine so she is actually answering a very interesting question here what is my language now when we ask this question to anyone the answer that we get is my language is my mother tongue now have you ever wondered why is it mother tongue why is it not father tongue what is so special about a language being associated with mother now it's a very curious thing and i would like to bring in another word here and that word is the word vernacular the word vernacular you will be surprised to know comes from a word which means which means color and the word vernacular if you look at it etymologically it has a pejorative meaning it has a derogatory meaning and it comes from the word verna it comes from the word verna which in fact comes from vernos in i think greek but the word verna is sanskrit and verna means caste okay and it actually refers to the language of the lower caste people low caste people so it's a very derogatory and it's a very negative word to begin with uh, but of course now we use it in a in a very normal sort of a way we do not think of the negative connotations that it once had mother tongue is not of course vernacular but it has come to be associated Uh, with it and it is now thought of as a synonym of the word vernacular so i just uh, refer to the origin of uh, the word vernacular to point out that sometimes we use words without knowing fully uh, their meaning so she is saying that there is no such thing as vernacular there is no such thing as one's own language instead of that what she says is why not let me speak in any language i like the language i speak becomes mine so when you are using a language it can be any language it becomes yours it's a very interesting contention that she is putting forth here and not only the language but also its distortions its queernesses all mine mine alone so you have a sense of possessiveness here it becomes mine alone and she is remember that she is writing this poem in english and when she is writing in english she is fully aware that it is not her mother tongue but she is possessing the language totally she is commanding the language she is having total uh, authority over the language that she is choosing to write in so what is her language what is the kind of english that she is using that is a question that she answers next and she says while answering this question she says it is half english half indian funny perhaps but it is honest so she is also making a case here for uh, indian english now you know that kamala das is an indian english poet she is writing in a tradition of indian literature written in english she is not writing english literature this is not english literature per se this is indian literature written in english and she is pointing out that the way we indians use the english language it is sometimes funny but it is honest it is half english half indian and of course uh, when we speak in english we use a lot of 
Indian words, we use Bengali words, we use Hindi words, we use maybe Punjabi words. So it becomes something that is distinct from the British English or, or the American English. We are not native speakers of the language, but at the same time, we have been able to formulate a new vocabulary. Several words have come into uh, existence due to uh, the influence of our own mother tongues, our own native languages. For example, in the English language, if you look up the, the Oxford English Dictionary, you will come across several Indian origin words like mantra, like guru, like lati, lati charge, maidan. Several words have come into being that are of the Indian origin. So it is funny at times, of course. And in this regard, I would like you to read another poem by Nisim Ezekiel. It's called Goodbye Party for Miss Pushpa T.S. I think you should read it because it's a, it's a commentary on the Indian English that we use, the, uh, the amusement that comes with it, its queerness, its absurdity. But at the same time, it's honesty, something that Kamala Das is pointing out here. So it is honest. It is as human as I am human. Now, uh, she is investing or injecting a human quality in uh, this language, the kind of language that she is fond of using, the kind of language that she's in fact using to write this poem. Uh, she, is, she thinks of it as being alive. It is as human as I am human. So, so she is not making any distinction she does not see any distinction between the language and her own self. So you have a kind of connection between the language that she is using and herself. So we can say, we can uh, extend this argument by saying that she is effecting a kind of construction of the self through uh, this language, the use of language. She says that myself is constructed partly by the language that I am using. And also note the colloquial tone of the poem. Often in this poem, you will find interjections like, look at the line, this line that I just read. It is as human as I am human. Don't you see? She is almost challenging the reader. She is almost uh, engaging the reader in a colloquial conversation. It is as human as I am human. Don't you see? Don't you see? It is so obvious. This is what she is trying to mean. It's so obvious. It's uh, something that, that does not even need to be questioned. It's there. It's out there. <clears throat> so it is as human as I am human. And it voices my joys, my longings, my hopes. And it is useful to me as cawing is to crows or roaring to the lions. So just like crows caw and just like lions roar, I write, I use language because it is my own. It is a part of myself and it voices, it expresses, it gives expression to my joys and my longings, my desires, my hopes and fears and every sort of emotion uh, that I go through. So language is a medium of communication and communication is uh, not only about information, but also about emotions and aspirations and, and longings and fears and desires, etc. So it comes naturally and therefore she uses uh, this simile here, uh, this imagery that is drawn from nature, which involves crows cawing and lions roaring. Just like a uh, lion roars, it comes naturally to the lion, uh, just like a cawing comes naturally to the crow. Speaking or writing in the language that I do comes naturally to me. This is what she is trying to say. Okay. It is human speech, the speech of the mind that is here and not there. Now, she is making a distinction between here and there. What does the word here mean? And what does the word there mean? I think it refers to not only a place, but also the sense of urgency with which she writes. It does not refer to the place where she is writing from, but also the time in which she is writing, okay? It is here and not there. So what she is trying to say in effect is it is in the present moment and it is not there in the future or in the past. The speech of the mind, and of course, 
how does a mind express itself it expresses itself through speech right also writing and we know that speech comes first then first we learn how to speak and then we learn how to write so writing has often been seen as a kind of substitute or a supplement to speech speech is given a kind of primacy so speech is uh, more direct more spontaneous because it comes directly out of one's mind we generally do not make any distinction between thinking and speaking uh, just like i am doing now i am not taking any time you know there is no lapse of time between my thinking and my speaking it's automatic it's spontaneous it it is very fast it's unnoticeably fast so uh, speech of the mind is something that that flows that is uh, like a stream and that is very very spontaneous and since it is spontaneous it is here in the present moment it is not in the in the future it is to be accepted and embraced in the present moment so a mind that sees and hears and is aware now she is going very empirical here because the mind we know that the mind cannot see we know that the mind cannot hear but the mind is aware of course because we have sense perceptions we have sense organs through which we receive sensory data or impressions and the mind just processes them and that is how awareness uh, is formed now awareness expresses itself through language language is all about expression not the deaf blind speech of trees in storm or of monsoon clouds or of rain or the incoherent mutterings of the blazing funeral pyre now uh, she identifies another kind of speech or linguistic uh, presence in nature she says that there are trees in storms there are monsoon clouds or there are you know when it rains in the monsoon season there is also the presence of another kind of speech but she is not talking about such kind of speech because according to her it is deaf and blind now this particular adjective you may find a bit weird or a bit odd because how can speech be blind blindness is associated with the ability to uh, see or not see it is associated with the sense of vision uh, it is not usually associated with sense of hearing uh, or the lack thereof so it's a bit weird that she should use this word deaf is understandable deaf speech is still understandable but blind speech it is something rather strange if you ask me uh, not the deaf blind speech of trees in storm or of monsoon clouds or of rain or the incoherent mutterings of the blazing funeral pyre now as a sensitive person as a sensitive poet she finds speech in nature as well and uh, if you if you listen to the sound of breeze or rustling of leaves you might find some kind of pattern there sound pattern sonic patterns but not generally speech but kamala das is comparing these sounds with speech but speech that is essentially deaf and blind why deaf and blind because they hardly express anything okay they are not expressive they are sounds they may also be called speech but they are not expressive so she makes a distinction between natural sounds and human speech speech is something that allows one to express himself or herself and through this expression identities are formed okay now i think i have made sufficiently clear the connection between identity and the ability to use language now she is going back to her childhood i was a child i was child and later they told me i grew for i became tall my limbs swelled and one or two places sprouted hair now she is talking about the process of growing growth puberty when she was a child and then later she grew up to be a teenager and then she reached uh, adulthood she is talking about the physical transformations that one goes through while growing up so i was i was child and later they told me i grew again you have the third perspective you have an outside perspective they told me i grew for i became tall 
my limbs swelled and one or two places sprouted hair. When I asked for love, not knowing what else to ask for, he drew a youth of 16 into the bedroom and closed the door. He did not beat me, but my sad woman body felt so beaten. Now when she grew up, she asked for love. She felt the desire to be loved. And what happened then? Not knowing what else to ask for, he drew a youth of 16 into the bedroom and closed the door. Now, it might mean several things, but I think in my interpretation, it means that she was married at an early age and she she was forced into having a kind of a physical experience or affair with a youth of 16. He did not beat me, but my sad woman body felt so beaten. Of course, this uh, this is her, this is Kamala Das talking about her physical experience okay and again you have the word you have the phrase woman body remember this is also a part of her uh, gender identity of course it is uh, it refers to her body image which uh, you know when a, when a person becomes an adult when he or she goes through that process of growing up there are certain transformations that come about in his or uh, or her own body image so she is now old enough to feel or understand that the body that she has now is that of a woman so this is how she describes it but my sad woman body it's sad because it's not in control of itself she does not possess her body instead someone else does so it is sad and it feels so bitten so you get an image of passivity. The weight of my breasts and womb crushed me. I shrank pitifully. So she is, since she is dominated, her experience of growing up to a woman was one of suppression and oppression. And therefore, she is not happy with herself, with her life. And therefore, the transformations that have come about in her body when she reached womanhood she is not very comfortable with it. I shrank pitifully. Then I wore a shirt and my brother's trousers. Now you have uh, another change in her coming about subsequently. She says that then I wore a shirt and my brother's trousers cut my hair short and ignored my womanliness. So I cut my hair short and ignored my womanliness. So I tried to be a boy, dress in saris, be girl, be wife, they said. Again, you have this word, they, the outsiders representing perhaps society, perhaps her community, perhaps her family members. So this, what did they say? They said, don't be like a boy. You are a woman and be like a woman, dress up like a woman, dress up in sari, be a girl, be wife, be a girl and be wife as if being a wife is the only identity that she can aspire to uh, in her life. Okay. Now we know that in Indian society, women are seen as either daughters or uh, wives or mothers, as if these are the gender roles they were born to play or born to perform, as if there can be no identity that a woman can create for herself. Okay, so this is what society says to her, uh, says to Kamala Das, be wife, be girl, don't be like a boy, don't dress up, don't cut your hair short because woman is supposed to have long hair. A woman is not supposed to wear trousers, she is supposed to dress up in sari. Be embroidered, be cook, be a quarreler with servants. Again, you have the gender roles ascribed to a woman. When a woman is part of a household, she is expected to stay indoors and she is expected to engage herself in activities like sewing and cooking and embroidering and also to oversee servants to conduct the household with sufficient care. And uh, also you have the word, the phrase fit in. This comes as a climax, fit in, fit in with the gender roles that have been consolidated, that have been kind of uh, made the foundation of the gender divide in our society. Fit in to that role. Don't try to be anyone else. Don't try to go beyond your gender identity. 
what is this gender identity what is the difference between say the word gender and the word sex so when a boy is born when a girl is born it's their uh, sex identity okay a boy and a girl but after growing up the girl is made to feel that she is a girl and there are certain things that are told to her don't do this do this uh, okay do's and don'ts come uh, into the picture same with boys for example you will often hear people saying boys don't cry which is absolutely nonsense because boys do cry boys also can have emotions and they can also express their emotions through tears so there are uh, certain roles that are ascribed to women and certain roles ascribed to men in society for example you know that a man uh, is supposed to be the head of the family and it is his responsibility to earn for the family and it is the responsibility of the wife to take care of the household take care of children you know bring up uh, children uh, uh, manage everything inside the house so the the world inside the household belongs to the woman whereas the world outside is a responsibility of the man this is how our society functions this is very unfortunate and things are changing although very slowly but uh, kamala das all those years ago she in this poem has talked about discussed these issues and there are of course autobiographical validations and elements behind writing this poem and then she says oh belong cried the categorizers now categorizers it's very evident that people who people who uh, ascribe or impose gender roles on uh, men and women and uh, they are nothing but categorizers they categorize people in terms of or according to their genders and what do they say belong fit in now belonging what is this word what does it mean what does the word belong mean where does one belong there are different kinds of uh, different senses of belonging for example we belong to our loved ones you know we, we belong to our parents we belong to a particular city we belong to a particular nation and again this word belong is related directly to the question of identity now if i say that i belong to uh, I, i belong to the hindu religion i i am saying that hinduism is a part of my identity okay now categorizers what are they saying they are saying that belong to a particular group and you will find it easy fit in we know that it's very easy to belong to some some group if we are part of a of, of a group or a community we are automatically protected so uh, fit in belong now kamala das is a rebel she does not want to belong she does not want to fit in she does not want to ascribe or be categorized don't sit on walls or peep in through our lace draped windows kamala das was a total tomboy and therefore she used to sit on walls and she used to climb trees she used to do all the things that boys would do uh, would do and therefore uh, she was often admonished by people who said that don't be like a boy you are a girl and act like a girl uh, they also said be amy or be kamala or better still be madhavi kutti so be a girl now these are girls names amy kamala madhavi kutti and so what they are saying in effect is be like a girl be a woman not a boy not a man it is time to choose a name a role not only a name but also a role what role a gender role a gendered role roles that only women should play don't play pretending games don't pretend to be a man that is don't play at schizophrenia or be a nympho don't act as if you have an illness don't uh, act as if you are deviant in any way socially deviant uh, you don't have schizophrenia you don't need to have a schizophrenia you don't need to be a nymphomaniac don't cry embarrassingly loud when jilted in love so don't cry out too loud don't make too much noise and we know that people do not like men in general do not like women to be loud women are expected to be very soft spoken very silent 
especially when it comes to a family household so don't cry embarrassingly loud when jilted in love what is being said here what is the message that we get here don't cry embarrassingly loud when jilted in love what does it mean it means do not express yourself suppress your emotions and then she continues and by now we have realized that this is actually a very autobiograph autobiographical poem she says i met a man loved him call him not by any name he is every man who wants a woman just as i am every woman who seeks love so i met a man uh, this particular man is not named he is generalized and she says that she loved him uh, she did not call him by any name because he is every man he is general he is generally every man who wants a woman just like i am every woman who seeks love so uh, both these identities are being generalized here universalized the hungry haste of rivers in me you have a river image you have a natural Im uh, image here the hungry haste of rivers just like uh, there are ebbs and flows in rivers uh, when the river flows it is being compared to the desire that she has within herself the desire to be loved the ocean starless waiting now she is using images that are lyrical and she is doing so deliberately to express the kind of desire that she had to be loved the ocean starless waiting and this waiting refers to the waiting the sense of waiting that she felt while expecting someone to arrive in her life uh, with love or rather waiting for love to happen who are you i ask each and every one now she is almost challenging the reader who are you i ask each and every one the answer is it is i now this is a question that uh, we know that it's a very very philosophical question in fact it lies at the root of philosophy who are we who am i how can this question be answered what is our identity and the only answer is it is i i am myself anywhere and everywhere i see the one who calls himself i in this world and we all we all use this personal pronoun to refer to ourselves the personal pronoun being i anywhere and everywhere i see the one who calls himself i in this world he is tightly packed like a sword in its sheath you also have another simile and just like a sword is packed tight in its sheath we cannot actually get out of our this uh, uh, this mold that we have created for ourselves called i we cannot get out of this selfhood this i ness as, as it were it is i who drink lonely drinks at 12 uh, midnight in hotels of strange towns it is i who laugh it is i who make love and then feel shame it is i who lie dying with a rattle in my throat i am sinner i am saint i am the beloved and the betrayed so there is no question of uh, going outside this i we are always already confined within ourselves there is no possibility of going outside oneself especially uh, when it is so condensed that it is just a letter the letter i and it means a lot it it refers to a lot of it may be a very insignificant letter but it lies at the root of philosophy the word i the personal pronoun i and what kamala das is saying is wherever i go i go as an i i go as myself there is no other identity that i can perhaps assume now there is a certain uh, kind of strangeness i feel uh, rather uh, a certain kind of sadness in this realization that one cannot move one outside oneself but what can one do one can use language i have no joys that are not yours now another pronoun comes into the picture comes into the equation and that is you i have no joys that are not yours here there is a final connection that uh, uh, in a way salvages this poem from uh, lapsing into uh, pessimism i have no joys that are not yours so she is directly addressing the reader she is addressing us and she is saying 
that I have no joys that are not yours. I too feel joys. I too feel happiness. The kinds of happiness that you feel. No aches which are not yours. I too call myself I. So this is how the poem ends. The word with the word I, with the letter I, and this is exactly how it uh, began. It began with the personal pronoun I. I do not, I don't know politics, but I know the names, and you can actually make a count of the number of times that the poet has used the word I. It's all about I. But who am I? Who is this I? Is it Kamala Das? Is it someone else? How does she perceive uh, this personal pronoun? How does she answer the question of identity? In the end, the question of identity is not answered. It remains it remains open, open ended. She says, "I have no joys that are not yours." So she is making a connection between people, between the self and the other, between the writer and the reader. And she says that emotions are universal. Joys and sorrows are universal. One cannot exclusively feel a kind of pain or a kind of happiness that is totally unique. We all go through similar emotions, and therefore, language is so important as a medium of expression, as a mode of communication.